Let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36. I know I'm teaching the book of 1 Corinthians. We're in verse 1. And um, I want to revisit with you some of the information I provided last Sunday. I made a statement that I think needed some clarification, and I'm going to clarify today. And so here's the good news. I get to do whatever I want. <laughs> and so I'm not bound to a, a specific lesson. You know, I don't have to go on. And now if you have a bulletin and you are reading the bulletin thinking that's what I'm going to be teaching today, it is not. It will be a repeat next Sunday of what you have in your bulletin. But uh, today I want to talk about eternal security and the dispensational changes that have taken place from the Old Covenant to the church age. This is a, a big deal to me, and I feel the need to revisit this because I am passionate about you. A professor in a university or a seminary will put out material and require the student to study it and embrace it, learn it. And if you fail the class, the professors a lot of times don't care. That's not me. I want to be certain that the people that I'm teaching are growing in the knowledge of the Lord and in his ways and in the doctrines of the Bible. And so last Sunday after the lesson, I was approached after each service with questions and then I had some emails that came in. And then I, even this past week, I was over in Western Washington, and some of our friends that were watching online over there asked me the same questions. And I realized I failed to communicate. And I always believe that if the student is not learning, it is not always the fault of the student. It is often the, the responsibility of the teacher to revisit the material. If you don't understand pre-algebra, we're going to keep going over it again and again until you do. Why move on until we have a grasp of these things that are foundational to, in our case, the study of the Bible. And so what I did in my casual fast conversation with you last week was mention the words eternal security. Now, many Christians know what I'm talking about when I think of eternal security. When you think of eternal security, you believe and understand that the nomenclature, eternal security, means that a born-again Christian who lives in the church age has been given regeneration, and by way of regeneration, you are guaranteed salvation and an eternity with the Lord. It's guaranteed. You can't mess it up. You can't break it. You can't throw it away. You can't forfeit it because it's not your work. It's God's work in you. And when I use the term eternal security and I use it loosely in a church age model like we are, uh, I feel that I needed to go back and revisit some specific doctrinal statements related to eternal security with two words. The first one is regeneration, and the second is sealing, the sealing power of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Covenant dispensation, we're talking about the period of history from the call of Abraham and through the cross, that period of time. So from the call of Abraham all the way through, uh, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, the prophets, the kings, and the, and, and the judges, and so forth, I'm going out of order, until you finally end up getting to Jesus coming in his first incarnational ministry, living among us here on the earth, suffering in our place for our sins, dying on the cross, being buried, resurrected from the dead, until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Those the bookmarks, the call of Abraham to the day of Pentecost, is all Old Covenant, which includes the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And so if you are reading your Bible and you're reading in the New Testament, since you have a page in your Bible that says New Testament, which you should tear out, oftentimes people get very confused about their doctrines. And in the Old Covenant, including in the languages, in the communications of the gospel era, the first incarnational ministry of Jesus Christ, no one was ever regenerated. People believed and they were saved. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He trusted the Lord and he was saved. But the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the individual that we experience in the church age is distinct to the church age. And when's the church age? Well, the church age is from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. So we're living within that period of time at the present time. So when we are dealing with the doctrine of eternal security, regeneration, the empowering and sealing of the Holy Spirit, we're dealing very specifically with a unique period of time known as the church age, something that was unknown in the old covenant dispensation. Let me give you an example. King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. He was called by God to be the first king of Israel. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet with an anointing oil and by, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He was a believer in God. He prophesied under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit came upon him. And he lived in the early years of his reign as king obediently to the Lord. And later he turned against the Lord, he disobeyed the Lord, and Samuel came to him chastising him under the word of the Lord, even commanding that he would be under discipline, and the Holy Spirit departed from him, and an unclean spirit from the Lord is the language we read in the Bible. In other words, the Lord allowed a demon to come and to dwell in Saul to the point of his torment. And he potentially died an unbeliever. Now, we don't know that. I would like to suggest that he came to his senses and that he indeed is in heaven. But we don't know. David, the king of Israel, saw this, and when he sinned against the Lord, he prayed, you find this recorded in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. David prayed that because he saw what had happened to Saul, because he realized, look, the anointing of God, the presence of God can come and go. In the Old Covenant dispensation, it was not at all uncommon for the Holy Spirit to come upon a person and then depart, or to be with people but not to permanently abide in them. There's a big difference. This is also why we have confusion in the Gospels when you have, for example, the parable of the sower. You've heard this taught in Christian churches in the church age uh, for probably centuries. The sower goes out and sows the seed, and some of the seed falls in the wayside, and some among the rocks, and some in the, in, the, in the soil that it has thorns that grows up among it, and some in good soil. And of course, the storyline goes that the devil comes, and he's the, like the birds that come and eat the seed, and immediately there's no fruit and no, no process. Uh, but then there's the the rocky soil, hard times, you know, persecution arises, you have no root, and you fall away. Uh, the, th th the cares of this life are represented by thorns and thistles that grow up, and the thorns uh, choke out the word until there's finally the last 25 percentile of individuals, and that seed falls into the good soil of their hearts, and then it brings forth much fruit. And if, if you are reading that as a Christian in the church age, you come up with the idea that a Christian can hear the word and even believe for a while and then fall away. No. 
that is written to Jews in the Old Covenant dispensation. You have to keep your dispensational models intact. A very distinct difference in the way the Holy Spirit was working with people before Pentecost and now after Pentecost. Very different. Nicodemus is an illustration of the same. Nicodemus, the, not a, but in the, in the Greek there's a definite article, John chapter 3, comes to Jesus at night and says to him, you know, hey, what's happening, man? And the Lord doesn't really respond to his conversation directly and says, you know, you must be born again or you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus, the ruler in Israel, says, hey, how's that going to happen? I mean, am I supposed to be born again after I have already been birthed from my mother? I'm an adult. I'm a grown-up. How can that happen? Now, he's speaking kind of pejoratively, uh, you know, and probably not so much antagonistically, but certainly it's pejorative. And so the Lord looks at him and he says, unless you are born of the water and of the spirit, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The water symbolizes natural birth. He makes that very clear because of the very next verse, he says, you have to be born of the flesh and born of the spirit. So he gives clarity to it. So you have to be born of the water and of the spirit or you won't see the kingdom of God. And in the context, Nicodemus is held accountable for the information that he should have understood. Jesus said to him, and you being the teacher in Israel don't know these things? Well, what in the world could Jesus be talking about? And that's why I take you to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to the tenses here. I will, future tense, Sanctify my great name, which has been profaned in the past, past tense, among the nations, which you have in the past profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am, future tense, hallowed in you before their eyes. Verse 24, I will take you, I will take you, future tense, from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Verse 25, I will, future tense, sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So you will, I will, this will happen. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you. Underline both I will and cause. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. This would have been the passage that Nicodemus was required to understand that the Lord had said to Israel, yes, you have sinned, yes, you have strayed, yes, you have been a bad testimony, but there is a day coming that I will do a new work with you, O house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, in Jeremiah, this is Ezekiel, in Jeremiah, he tells them that he is going to make them completely new, and he will begin a new covenant with them, not like the old covenant where he wrote in tablets of stone, but where he will put his spirit within them and he will write in their hearts his commandments and that he will then cause them to walk in his precepts as the result of the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because I made the comment last week that Saul, had he not trusted Jesus for salvation, although he was a devout Jew, a believer, 
a Pharisee among the Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin in the law blameless, exceeded above all of his peers in Judaism. And I might suggest to you, as a believer, he did all these things because Christ now had come. And remember, we're still in the old covenant. And Paul is consenting to the death of Stephen, persecuting the church, that he, on the way to Damascus, has an encounter with the risen Christ himself, is therefore repentant from unbelief based on the fact that Jesus has revealed himself to them and then called to be an apostle by the will of God and is commanded by the Lord to believe him And had he not believed Jesus as Messiah, Paul would have been lost. If he had rejected Jesus, he would have been lost. Now, I make this very clear because I want you to know the difference between the Old Covenant and the church age. In the church age, you can't be lost. In the church age, God has called you to himself He is the one that has chosen you from before the foundations of the world, predestined you to adoption as sons. He is the one that regenerates you by putting his spirit within you and causes you to walk in his precepts. You need to know that. Now, there'll be a reason why in a minute. But Saul of Tarsus did not have eternal security. Had he, in the old covenant dispensation, if he had rejected Jesus as Messiah, he would have still been saved. And then we would have the problem of dual covenant theology, which we reject. Every Jew must trust Jesus for salvation. Now, let me give you another example from the New Testament writings to the Hebrews. This is the book of Hebrews. Many Christians read the book of Hebrews as though it's written to them. It's not. It's written to the Hebrews. That's why it says, and to the Hebrews. There's a reason for titles. When the author to the Hebrews tells the Hebrews in chapter 6, a very controversial passage for many people, that those who have been once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and of the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, if they should fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. He is saying to the Jews, the Hebrews, who have been in the faith for 1,600 years, not to Gentile Christians that are living in the church age, were in the faith. And there's only one faith. They were in the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes. They were looking forward to the promises that were given by the prophets. They were the ones that embraced the commands and the, the decisions of the judges. They were the ones that studied the poetry, the history. They were part of the history. It was their religious faith, the Jewish faith. And if the Hebrews, who were enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, I mean, man, they ate the manna in the wilderness. They saw the miracle of fire by night and pillar of cloud by day. They saw the, the, the Red Sea open. They crossed the Jordan. They took the land. I mean, these people had the richest history of a relationship with God. If they reject Jesus... They crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And this is why the command goes forth in the book of Hebrews, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion because the Hebrews had to believe in Jesus. They did not have regeneration. When... Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't say, well, you have been. Nobody was born again until after the resurrection, until the day of Pentecost. Therefore, the 
infilling and the sealing of the Holy Spirit had not occurred. And the, the believers did not have the security that you have in Christ. Now, you might ask yourself, well, pastor, why are you doing this? Because I know that out of millions of Christians in the world today, many, scores, untold numbers, believe that they can lose, forfeit, the salvation that's provided them in Christ. And that's not true. Because it's not you at work. It's God at work. Jude, in his epistle about the apostates, by the way, all the apostates that he's referring to were Jews, not Christians in the church age. But to the church, he writes about them and then tells them in the concluding remarks of his letter, in the book of Jude, you can read it yourself, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless and blameless before him at his coming, to the only wise God be glory both now and forever, amen. Not unto you, unto him. It's him. But people read their Bibles without keeping their dispensational boundaries intact. Let me give you another example. I told you about the parable of the sower already. I think I did. This is the third service. I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> How about the fact that we are dealing with the parable that Jesus told about the vine and the vine dresser? If you don't bring forth fruit, you're like a branch. It's withered away and it will be cut off and thrown into the fire. And people read that as Christians in the church age who have been regenerated and they say, oh man, I better hurry up and try to produce a lot of fruit because if I don't produce fruit, then I'm not going to be saved. God will cut me off and throw me in the fire. Guys, that was before the church age. It was before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, before the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit and the sealing unto the day of redemption, which is the guarantee of your redemption in Christ. It's in the Old Testament. Your Bible says New Testament. You read it and you go, oh, it's the New Testament. This is the doctrine I'm supposed to believe today. No. That is actual doctrine that applied before the cross. And it also then is reinforced by Jesus saying to the Jewish audience that he was ministering to, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. John, in his epistle, revisits this and says, if you reject the Son, you've rejected the Father also. He's writing to the Jews. He's telling them, look, man, you have to believe in Jesus. Saul of Tarsus, you have to believe in Jesus. He is the only way. And now, my friends, in the church age, if you have trusted Christ for salvation, it is because God has illuminated this truth to you, just like he did to Saul on the road to Damascus. Might have been a different way, a different experience, but it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He is the one that has opened up your blind eyes and softened your hard heart and opened up your deaf ears so that you could hear and understand and know the gospel and trust him for salvation and then be sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. Go with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I'll just read this in closing. Um, we, if you guys, I read this chapter so much, you probably memorized it by now. One of the things I didn't get to finish in my discussions with you last week and again, let's quote, because I'm actually supposed to be teaching 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1a. Remember, that's what we started last week. And let me quote it to you. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, right? Through the will of God. Now, next Sunday is Sothenes, our brother. That's the whole sermon, Sothenes. 
And then I'm going to take a whole bunch of verses at once. And we'll get moving. But look, by the will of God. Now, remember, the Lord revealed himself supernaturally and miraculously to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And it was then that Paul's view of Jesus changed. So he repented of unbelief. And then the call of God was to apostleship. We covered that last week. But by the will of God. Look as I just read this again. I've just got a few minutes and I will try to summarize that at the end. Blessed be, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Oh, I wish I had a half an hour. <laughs> Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to the will of God, according to the good pleasure of his will. No inconvenience, no plan B. You didn't put him out. This was his plan. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, with he, which he pur purposed in himself. You think God likes this idea? That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, you might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, now, guys, underline this. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In the church age, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is only occurring in the church age, in this dynamic dispensation, when you are born again, when you are regenerated. This is what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, a believing Jew, about. And he even said, you must be, future tense, you must be born again. And so now, moving past the cross into the church age, believers are. This is what Jesus was referring to when he told his disciples you know that the comforter is here, or the Holy Spirit, he's here with you, but he shall be in you. There's a big difference. Being present and then regenerating you is altogether different. And so now you've been born again by the word of God, incorruptible seed of the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You are sealed for the day of redemption. Now, I only point this out, and I tried to point this out last week. I still feel like I'm wanting to now have a Q&A and just let you talk me through and, and, and let, talk, let me talk you through this. There's a reason I want you to know this. Because you can have security in the Lord. That's what we mean by eternal security. I wanted to point out that then, last week, that Saul of Tarsus had to believe in Jesus. And, and, and there was no doctrine of eternal security. There was no regeneration. There was no guarantee of an inheritance. They had to trust the Lord throughout as the faith developed and in, in through the progressive knowledge of now Christ has come and you're accountable to the fact that Jesus is here and you must believe in him. Thus Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now you have to trust Christ. But believers in the church age that are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise are born again, and therefore it is no longer you trusting him, it is he working in you. 
Now you're still trusting him. But it is the result of his Holy Spirit who is at work in you that is causing the trust. It is causing you to walk in his statutes, causing you to walk in his precepts. That's why it's no longer you abiding in him. It is he abiding in you. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. I know what somebody is going to say. Well, wait a minute. What if I have a crisis of faith? Well, God will get you through it. If you're genuinely born again, God will get you through it. Now, there are people that have professions of faith that are not regenerated. We understand that. But if you have been born again, God is going to get you through it. What if I have all kind of crazy ideas? God will get you through it. Now, some of you are dense, and <laughs> it'll take you longer. Some, some of you, you might not get it until you're in heaven. But you know what? When you get to heaven, look at, let me close with this. Here's what you see in the book of the Revelation when John writes about the, the redeemed. They are singing a new song. And they said, all glory and honor and power is unto you. By then they get it. See, we can get it now. All the glory belongs to him. You're not trying. I love what Daryl told me one day. He says, does God have to try to do anything? I thought, man, that's a great way of saying that. Does God have to try to get your attention? Like it's really hard for him? Look, you guys, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That's why I especially enjoyed here when I saw Tom McMahon, Brian Call on the screen a minute ago. I don't know if you noticed the stop sign with all the bullet holes in it. Did you see the little stop sign right next to it? It said, stop it. And that's why when we talk about being a believer, if you're living in disobedience, stop it. You can stop it because God has given you the power to stop it. And if you don't stop it, he will stop it in you. But the point I'm making here is because I'm your shepherd, I'm your pastor, I care about you. I wrestled with this all week because I thought, man, I, I didn't communicate this well. I want to talk about it again because I want you to have security. I want you to know in whom you have believed and know that he is able to keep that which you have committed unto him against that day. And he is the one that is keeping you. You are not keeping yourself. Abide in me? Yeah, of course. But see, now he abides in you. And now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of of his glory to the only wise God be glory and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. Nourish us, Lord, we pray in these truths and sort this out, Lord, in our souls, in our hearts. Let us keep our dispensations intact, our teaching clear. Let us understand that every Jew and every Gentile needs to trust you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. And let us also, as church-age believers, know that we are secure, we are absolutely secure in your grace, by your grace, through your power and by your power. And therefore, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.